I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city on earth. Beat a bop, bop, boom. Maddie, hit it. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the most haunted city on earth. My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie, and I'm Meth Hogs. You're Meth Hogs. I'm meth Hogs. I hope you're not Meth Hogs. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bunch of Meth Hogs in a JT suit. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You're a Meth Hog in a <laughs> trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> meth Hog in a trench coat. <laughs> I, don't know. I just are. turned into a country music. But yes, we are back with part two of Kentucky Cryptids. Uh-huh. Kentucky Cryptids. With a K. Yes, yes. Um, and so. Yeehaw! Yeehaws! Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I got that up for you. Very so we'll nice. go for it real fast. Let's talk about it. Cool. And Pound the, a boat. And for those of you who cannot see what JT just put up on the screen, uh, basically, we are up for quite a few uh, categories for Connect Savannah's Best of Savannah this year for 2024. So Connect Savannah, it does a thing where they do the best of Savannah competition every single year. It's a big deal in Savannah. It's probably one of the biggest awards that you could receive. Um, so it's it's always a big deal for us, especially as small business owners. Um, and so we would greatly appreciate if you guys can vote for us. So we're up for Best Local Actress, is myself, uh, Best Local Theater Production, the Savannah Underground, which is our immersive theater. Best, best Local Theater Director is JT That'll be under John Taylor Timmons. That's his professional name. Uh, best place to work, the Savannah Underground. Uh, best local TikTok at Honda City Podcast. Best local influencer is Eni Enika Edif- Edenfield. Uh, and best local podcast is the most haunted city on earth. So, yes. yes. Boom. Definitely, y'all go vote for us. Uh, you can vote every single day. And if you are not already on the Haunted City podcast fan base on Facebook, um, Ashley and Dawn have been posting like crazy killing about it. everything. They've been absolutely killing it. And they post the link. So you can absolutely. find the link there as well. But Quick interjection. Yes. I just realized um, if anybody out there has any connection to Michael Ian Black. Oh, Michael Ian Black. Uh, amazing comedian. Uh, founding member of um, of uh, Up- Upright Citizens Brigade, or oh you know, yeah, it's, it's, uh, mm-hmm. he's he actually lives in Savannah. Um, uh, he actually wrote a ghost story from his house here in Savannah. Oh wow! So if anybody has any connection to him, point him our direction because okay. we would love to have him on to I, hear his ghost story. I actually might have a connection to that. Yeah, because absolutely, I had a professor who used to uh, perform with Upright Citizens. David Stork? Yeah. 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 Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I think that um, uh, he has been, you know, uh, kind of active in the downtown mm-hmm. scene. Uh, I, I, mm-hmm. uh, I've seen him around. Um, if I do, I will probably accost him. Um, <laughs> but if you if, if anybody out there has any connection, we would love to have him on and hear his ghost story. Yes. And, nope. and if you are listening yourself, um, which I highly doubt that he's yeah, listening. It seems, it seems unlikely. Um, but if he is listening, we want you on the show. Yes. Um, but yeah. So now we're going to get into some good old Kentucky cryptids. We are. We are. But we're going to address the, the big button. red button. We have oh, a by big the way, red button. There's a sign on this button that says do not press. And I have been showing incredible self-control yes. by not yes. pressing the big red button. That's why I put it there, Chris. Because you'd press it immediately if you mm-hmm. saw it. I you would. But it's so you tempting. Would. Nope. No. No. Anyway, all right. So <laughs> this idea came mm-hmm. from a para junkie. Mm. Uh, she just commented and was like, "We need a button," and you'll see what it what it says. And I thought that it was like I thought it was genius, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Yeah, I think we do need that." So we do have it now. It's going to be part of the podcast. We won't use it every episode, uh, but it definitely will be something that I believe that y'all will be able uh, to use. And um, no, not yet. I just wanted to give a massive shout out to our para junkies. I know we talk about them every episode, As but we like, should. but like they 
we li- like we listen to the pair junkies oh, like hard they yes. have created a map like a, i would argue the majority of this show was, was their ideas at this point mm-hmm. right um so just a big shout out to everyone who is a pair junkie everyone who uh in the future that will become a pair junkie and give us even better ideas uh but i think now is the time to press the big red button so go ahead and move the big red button just a little bit towards y'all madison okay. um it should be heard through the microphone, but you can go ahead and put your microphone over it. Yeah, there we go. And here we go. <laughs> that is correct. Oh. We needed this button. We yes. did need this button. This is, well, how many times have we said that specifically? Yes. <laughs> I love, is that you? It's me. That's so funny because it sounds like a like 1920s yes. like version of a yes. ghost. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. Oh, okay, now, oh, oh. that's what you sound we, uh, like. We just got a puppy. Um, we're fostering a puppy. Oh, and uh, I didn't know we this. were talking about doing the dog talking yes. buttons. Yeah, for the puppy. Uh, this would be a hilarious dog talking uh, button. Like the dogs, like um. Oh, it's bath time. <laughs> so it's funny. I like it. JT and I did the button thing with Argyle because she's smart enough. We're like, she would absolutely figure this out. And the ghost started right. using the uh, button. And then we filmed it. We did. We did. We it happened it. all the time until eventually we finally got rid of the buttons. But, you know, it's like it was happening all the time. So, yeah, you should try that and find out. And Megan will kill us. <laughs> and Megan will kill us if that happens. If it turns and, into ghosts. Yes. Uh, it, it's it's a, a cute, cute puppy and seems smart. It's only, um, seems. It's only well, seems. But it's ten weeks old, so, so you never it know. could it could be a lie. Can't it, it, tell me this. It only knows how to pee on things That's right okay. now, but That's it's okay. smart about it. So it's smart okay. about it. What kind of what, what what kind of dog? It is a um, it is a uh, pit bull, mm-hmm. but I think it's a pit lab because okay. it's got a longer snout. You know, it's not as yeah. as, yeah. as, yeah. as stumpy Stomp. faced. Stompy faced. What? Stop that. How dare you? How dare you? Frankie. Oh, yeah. My, Michaela Gowan said, JT said, copyright strike avoided. <laughs> That's so cute. That is a uh, baby. Oh, pumpkin. Yeah. You show the camera. Oh, yeah. Oh. What's, Can you see that? What is the puppy's name? Yes. So um, when we got it, they called it Farquad, which we are Farquad. not. Farquad. Farquad. We're, we're not going to call this puppy Farquad because A, it's Lord. weird to say out loud. Yeah. Um, and B, we just didn't feel that it was a Farquad. So we decided on Oberon. Oberon. Ooh, Oberon's cool. Oberon's a great name. Um, it we actually call him Obi. is mm-hmm. a, yeah, and we call it Obi. Uh, and uh, it is based on. <laughs> So, of course, it's Midsummer Night's King of the Fairies. Mm-hmm. But um, Megan and I listened to a book series called the Iron Druid series. Mm. And uh, the Iron Druid has a dog named Oberon. And it's a major character throughout the whole series of the books. Um, and we just love that series of books. We love the character of Oberon from the books. And, of course, Fairy King. So <laughs> That's way better than what I was thinking. I was thinking Brussels sprouts. I, well, it's and, like, uh, <laughs> Megan was like, we need to name it a food. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what you do. You name dogs foods. You know, cheddar. And <laughs> yeah. No, Russell Megan Sprout, and I yeah. are on the same yeah. wavelength here. <laughs> but Oberon's a cool name. That's a that's that a strong cool name. name. Right. That is you strong. know, if you like, grow into an Oberon. Yes. Like now he's Obi, but one day mm-hmm. he'll be yeah. an Oberon. When he's old or is when it, he's wise. Yes. <laughs> he's our he's our first cryptid. Yes. Yeah. Oberon. <laughs> first cryptid. Fay dog. Fay dog. dog. And Fay Cat. We have all the Fay animals. We do have all the Fay animals. But all right. Oh, we have the cauldron of cryptids. The cauldron of Kentucky country cryptids. Don't abbreviate that. No. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh my god! I didn't mean for this to happen. This went right, very. I'm fit. reaching into the cauldron. <laughs> and what I brought out is, hey, the Hopkinsville goblins. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right, the Hopkinsville goblins. Goblins. So, the Hopkinsville Goblins case, also known as the Kelly Hopkinsville Encounter, is a well-known alleged extraterrestrial encounter 
which is why I wore my alien shirt today. Aliens! Yeah, aliens. That occurred in 1955 in Kelly and Hawkinsville in Christian County, Kentucky. The incident has become a part of popular folklore and is often cited in discussions of UFO sightings and supposed alien visitations. So the date and location, the event took place on the night of August 21st, 1955 at a farmhouse near Kelly and Hopkinsville. The primary witnesses were the Sutton family and their friends, and in total, there were 11 people at the farmhouse, including several adults and children. The witnesses described encountering small humanoid beings. These beings were reported to be around three feet tall with pointed ears, thin limbs, and long arms. Hmm. Sounds like a goblin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Goblin-esque. Very. And they were said to have large, round eyes and a metallic silver skin. Mm. So... um, Might have been dealing with elves. Yeah. Honestly? Uh, The elves. That's a good point. Uh, So the encounter began on the evening of August 21st, 1955, after one of the family members, Billy Ray Taylor, that's a country name. Oh, yeah. yeah. Billy Ray Taylor. (laughs) Claimed to have seen a bright, unidentified flying object land in a gully near the Sutton family farmhouse. Taylor and another man, Lucky Sutton, were... What? (laughs) Lucky Sutton? Lucky Sutton. Lucky Sutton, get down there and look at them (laughs) silver-eyed people. Could you imagine? (laughs) Uh, we're the first to report seeing the creatures. After Taylor's report of the UFO sighting, they claim to have seen a strange creature approaching the house from the woods. The family became frightened and armed themselves. Of course, because it's Kentucky. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and they claimed that over the next few hours, these beings repeatedly approached the house, peering in through windows and doors, leading to a series of confrontations. The family members reported firing their guns at the creatures, <laughs> seemingly without effect. It's like the Hatfields and McCoys versus the aliens. Uh, basically. There was little physical evidence of the creatures. The family claimed that the beings made a metallic sound when struck by bullets. Oh, well, they were probably wearing spacesuits. Exactly. They weren't silver skinned. They were wearing spacesuits. spacesuits. And the family claimed that the beings um, and that they floated above the ground and could move with considerable speed. Nice. Eventually, the situation became so intense that the family decided to leave the farmhouse and seek help. They drove to the Hopkinsville police station and reported the incident. Their visibly, their visibly shaken state convinced the police to investigate. Police officers and other officials visited the farmhouse, and they didn't find any evidence of the creatures, but noted signs of distress among the family members and evidence of gunfire around the home. Following the event, the story quickly attracted media attention, leading to a mix of public intrigue and skepticism. The family was subjected to significant media scrutiny and public attention, which they found overwhelming, as you can imagine. (laughs) Uh, Despite investigations, there was no conclusive evidence that the event was a hoax. The family members, including those without any interest in UFOs or science fiction, remained consistent in their accounts. The Kelly Hopkinsville encounter had a lasting impact on the family and the local community. It remains a significant case in the UFO folklore due to the intensity of the encounter and number of witnesses involved. Mm. So that is very so L actually just said, OMG, my childhood best friend's mom is from there. I used to stay there before uh, before summer camp. What? What? Yeah, that's just someone someone hit that button for me. We need a microphone go. just on it. Yeah, right? I know, right? Yeah. Just a little mini mic. Just a little Literally. Mini mic on it. Oh, no, Lord. that it, they're so interesting. It's like it's fascinating, and it's mm-hmm. it's also interesting to note that this type of entity is not uncommon, mm-hmm. especially in the foothills and the mountains. Right. You know, and you hear about it all the time. Uh, diminutive creatures sound like the moon-eyed humanoids, people. the moon-eyed people. Mm-hmm. Um, even uh, the story of Rip Van Winkle, uh, if you remember. He is up in the mountains in upstate New York, and he runs into and runs afoul of little people who are bowling in the mountains. <laughs> uh, but that notion that there there is a uh, uh, a species or a, a, a class of creature that looks humanoid, right, lives in the woods, pointy ears, you know, the classic uh, goblin elf yeah. notion. Um, because I think if you if you actually go around the world, you're going to find in mountainous regions these small humanoid 
right. beings. Uh, what's interesting about this is the floating. Yes. I and think that the they floating move makes it very interesting. And, and yeah, and that they move at speed, they're floating. Um, being bulletproof, that's kind of uh, almost normal for the type of entities you're talking about. Right. Um, because uh, when you talk like elves and elven, they're well known for making great armor. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's know. very true. Yeah, yeah because so, they're um, uh, blacksmiths. Right, usually. they're blacksmiths, or, or they they are gifted like mithril steel and all yeah. that good stuff. Uh, so it depends on on what kind of fantasy uh, elements you are drawing from, because most fantasy creatures uh, actually are drawn from folklore and local legend, and you know these are not. This wasn't someone just sitting down and making up elves. Elves were actually a part of a well-known belief structure, right? And people believed in uh, these these creatures that lived and inhabited the woodlands and the mountainous regions. So yeah, it's it's very fascinating. Um, and I love that they call them goblins and it's, they don't call them aliens, right? Like they don't they don't go in for because it's obviously an alien encounter as far as all the story right. elements. But they call them goblins. They're like, we can handle the thought of a goblin, but right. not an alien. Yeah, alien, I don't know. But it sounds like it could, if you're going on the alien front, it sounds like it could be like a species, like a subspecies of gray almost. Right. Yeah, like, yeah there's a lot of gray uh, identifiers except for the ears. Right. Grays generally don't have ears at all. But it does make me wonder again that maybe they were wearing spacesuits. Mm. And maybe the ears that they saw were like antennae or you know something like that. Um, because also grays are notoriously not bulletproof. Uh, they are very susceptible to yeah. bodily harm, but if they were wearing spacesuits, especially spacesuits that allowed right. them to fly around, um, that's something that could be there. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Hop Hopkinsville. Hopkinsville. You go, you call you, them goblins. You, you got them goblins. You got them goblins. You go, Gwen Coco. And the great cryptid cauldron is back. It's Bring back. forth a cryptid. Methog. 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 Metals, you for you all See, watching on the YouTube. Hardcore country music right there. Metal, yeah. Oh, yeah. Diddly, We've all ding, been ding. waiting for the meth hog. Ding ding uh, ding 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 ding. Every ding, ding. Christmas, the children gather around waiting for the meth hog. <laughs> all right, here is a photo of a meth hog. It's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the same photo. Oh, did you? Oh. Yes. <laughs> that that is that's 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 just a warthog that's With disease. out of its element. Yes. <laughs> All right. So meth the meth hog. hogs are mutant meth fueled hogs mm. and are terrorizing the hills of eastern Kentucky. Uh, in the decade or so since their first appearance, these giant rage filled animals have destroyed cars. That's just a normal hog. I was going to well, say, if you've not run into a wild boar, right? Wild boars are incredibly incredibly dangerous and yes. hard to kill they yep. are um well these are giant and rage-filled animals, <laughs> giant rage -filled animals. <laughs> and they have destroyed cars homes livestock and have already killed several people so wild hogs have been roaming the hills of eastern kentucky for centuries sure like most places here in the south um and while these animals can grow to gigantic sizes they are generally harmless unless cornered and will do their best to keep out of human company that's fair that all started to change in the early 2000s when reports of enormous <laughs> deformed hogs started coming in from the hills around Harlan. Sure. Nobody knows the exact origin of these mutant animals, but the best guess is that a pack of wild hogs came up on one of the many small chemical refining businesses located. <laughs> chemical <laughs> refining <laughs> businesses. <laughs> I see you, chap. Are you making some methamphetamine? Excellent. <laughs> Please refine it. <laughs> I'll be having tea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Chemical refining business. Yeah. Yes. Throughout Harlan County. Oh, um, yeah. If you know, you know. <laughs> Either in an effort to make the crystal meth he was brewing more potent or simply to cut corners in production, the particular producer seems to have th been throwing in pretty much whatever he could find down at the local Walmart in a plastic bottle with a do not drink warning label. <laughs> Whatever combination of chemicals he stumbled upon, it turned out to be irresistible to a pack of local hogs. Sure. <laughs> Plus, of course. Of they course, eat everything. They, they do. Yeah. I was going to say, what isn't irresistible to a, a, to a pack of 
hungry hogs. Seriously. Plus, it had an added benefit of being laced with enough hormone-altering goodness to cause the animal's latent DNA goodness. to become active in their whole uh, physiognomy to go well hog wild. Ugh. So really, there he was just making uh, anabolic steroids, basically. And the the hogs got them, and 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 now they're just roid raging. They are <laughs> roid raging, and the first sighting. Like, do you even lift, bro? <laughs> and then they eat you. They do. The first sightings of the meth hogs, as they were soon uh, to being called, happened in 2005 in the hills of Harlan County. A hunter reported being charged by an enormous hog that he estimated to be around 10 feet long and about four feet high and weigh about 900 pounds. It's like a, it's like a water buffalo coming at you. Oh, yeah. The, the pair junkies, the pair junkies want uh, the American version of Godzilla versus King Kong, which is meth hog versus cocaine bear. Yes. yes. <laughs> I don't think yes. they fight each other. Honestly, I think they, they get, go into they, business. They team up. Yeah. They'd be they like, team up. You want to make a <laughs> They're just chemical like... refining business? <laughs> no. And the meth hog's like, yeah, let's yeah. do it. Yeah. Oh, Lord. But I feel like the meth hog would be the really bad business partner because right. he would just eat, eat all of the meth. <laughs> How many times do I have to tell you? Quit Don't eating eat the, the merchandise. Quit eating the product. Y'all, Yo, there's, the there's a. Like, ah, all right, come on. Ah, it's all good. <laughs> There is a movie called uh, Boar, um, yeah. and oh, Maddie, sure. I think you and I watched it we together because, um, you know, I'm a freak. And so uh, it is an Australian feature. horror film, and I loved it. I loved it. And it's about a it, it's about like a boar that is just absolutely massive, and they can't take it down. And it goes and kills called Razorback. Everybody. That was the same. Mm. Yeah. Razorback. Yeah. Razorback. Razorback. Yeah. And Razorback was pretty much the same thing, just a giant boar. Because, yeah. Don't mistake, it's this size is not un, unimaginable uh, because mm -hmm. hogs get huge. Mm -hmm. They do get large. I mean, and, and if you're estimating something that's running at you, you're, you you might exaggerate here and there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, because. Uh, Ten feet long and four feet high is a weird long low thing. Yeah, yeah. You it think is. it'd be taller if it was that long, mm -hmm. um, but I don't. I don't know enough about hogs to be perfectly yeah, honest. That's fair. Because, um, yeah, no. But hogs are very dangerous. <laughs> yes. Sure are. Wild and hogs, wild boars. Wild boars are very dangerous. They are. They they're will gore you. Are and you adorable. need a pretty powerful weapon to take one down. Mm -hmm. Because their skin is very thick. And so they can absorb a lot of damage. And they'd be rooting and tooting. Rooting and tooting. And the hog, uh, the meth hogs at least, um, also seem to have not one, but two sets of unusually long tusks. Oh, that's interesting. All protruding at odd angles from its mouth. <laughs> so that's comforting. Oh, yeah. Um, the hog came after the man very aggressively, and he had to very hurriedly climb a nearby oak tree to escape the animal. The hog repeatedly charged the tree, and the man said that he shot the beast multiple times, which seemed to, and I quote, piss it off more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a fact of hogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to kill. They will chase you. Going up a tree is the best way to go. And I have heard uh, from hog hunters before that the hog will beat on the tree. <laughs> don't, don't be caught alone. With in a hog. hog country. In all country. <laughs> After several hours. Frankie the, Westbury said that sounded like Cat Williams. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, after several hours, the hog apparently grew bored and wandered off. Yeah. And the hunter. Like do. Well, he started to come down. Yeah, from he's his, like, I need more meth. I need more meth. <laughs> and the hunter returned to his truck as quickly as possible. Since the, that first sighting, um, meth hogs have been reported throughout eastern Kentucky, and the hogs have been ravaging livestock in the area. Farmers have reported countless missing chickens, dogs, goats, and even reported seeing giant hogs dragging full-grown cows off into the woods. Holy mackerel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hang on. <laughs> We're having way too much fun with that button. It's good. It's a good time. It is. Um, in 2008, the meth hogs have claimed their first human victims. A family of four was camping what? in the Kentonia State Forest in early September. Their tent was discovered by a ranger completely destroyed, and their entire campsite had been wow. trampled into the ground. Blood and traces of clothing were found in the immediate area, but no further sign of the family was ever discovered. Wow. Which, by the way, um, if you are a fan of true crime, well, mm -hmm. not, not even true crime, um, just crime uh, literature, they, uh, they oftentimes say 
the best way to get rid of human body is to put it in a hog pen because mm -hmm. the hog will eat mm. all of it. They eat the teeth, which They'll is usually what right. get people. Right, exactly. So you JT, didn't hear from us, though. No, but JT and I is... Uh, well, we didn't put it out first. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's pretty well... I mean, and that's that's... Like... I do a lot of writing and I will do a lot of like Google searching. And if my Google search was any indication of whether or not I'm on a FBI watch list, <laughs> I'm going to jail tomorrow <laughs> because I'm all about well, what else what? does the most. How do you, you know, <laughs> if I ingest this poison, if I were to shoot a person at 40 feet. For, what a <laughs> so JT's mom and I are both freaks. <laughs> um, they are. And we the freaks. They we, get along. Real we well love of that. true crime, and we've had in-depth conversations about this oh, sure. in a hi totally hypothetical way. But we <laughs> completely judge people's thoughts because people usually think, well, just pour acid on the body, but it doesn't take down the teeth, and that's how you get caught. And so we were both in agreement. We're like, if for some reason we ever had to hide a body, we're going to hide it in a hog pen because it will be gone. It's very true. So it's now you all know. And that's, that's a common – yeah, yeah. I, I want to say that um, Hannibal – Made it very popular. Yes, very popular mm -hmm. notion mm -hmm. that that hogs will will eat every bit of you. Um, yeah. No. So don't put it in an acid bath. That's just messy. I have to tell a story, short one, because I feel like on this podcast I will never be able to tell it. Like I'll never have another opportunity. Bring it. Yes. At I used to work at Sunny's Barbecue for five years. Madison, you already know this. Yes. Um, I had a regular. He was an old man. He would leave me a five dollar bill. Uh, he'd come in full camo and his sleeves and leg. It looks like he never washed them, but he didn't smell. Uh, he was about sixty, but his his uh, sleeves and legs were like covered in blood spatter. And he's a hunter, right? So I'm sure. thinking he's. I'm thinking you know he's. This is him uh, field dressing a deer yeah. or something he like that. He just came back or something. Exactly. Getting some lunch after. Exactly. And so uh, he'd come in every single Sunday um, at about 10 to 11. And one day um, it was abnormally slow for a Sunday. So I decided to go ahead and, uh, you know, sit and talk to him about hunting a little bit. I thought maybe he could give me some advice. And I asked him what kind of hunting he did. And he says he does hog hunting. And I said, oh, OK, cool. We have invasive species. All right. And I'm like, what, do you, what caliber do you use to kill the hog? And he says, I don't use a gun. Right. And I was like, I was like. What? Yeah, I, literally. I was like that. I was like, what do you use? A spear? And he goes to his side. And I'm mm -hmm. like, we're doing we're doing this yeah. right now. And he pulls out a massive knife. Yeah. And he sits in the trees above feed. I'm not kidding. This man said he sits in the trees every Sunday morning above the above his food plot and he jumps down onto Mama Hog and j kills her in like by stabbing her in the neck over and over mm -hmm. again. And uh yeah, that's that's my story. Well, I went hog hunting and that was the the preferred method was a spear with a it basically had like a bowie knife at the end of a big yeah, stick. Yeah. It's like a bayonet and, kind of uh, deal, it, it right? was like yeah. I'm not prepared for this. For yeah. the, the hand to hand combat with a boar. It just, well, I was. It's I, adrenaline thing. Yeah. It has to be. I went with a bow and arrow. So we were bow hunting, and he laughed at me. And I was like, "What is going on?" <laughs> I thought you said we were bow hunting. Mm -hmm. He's like, "No, we're hunting with bow." Bow oh. is like another man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got it. Got it. <laughs> Bo was his buddy. And oh, so Lord. I was like, okay, well, do you have a a rifle I can use? And he's like, well, we don't use rifles. And we, uh, yeah. Because, use, because because it's exciting. Well, um, I think there's something about like the impact uh -huh. and the the chance of, of 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 downing it at the right point. Yeah. It's like, no, you want to be right up on it, and you want to stab it as many times as you possibly can. That, yeah. I'm like, I'm, that's uh, that's full adrenaline. Yeah, that's it's like you're 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 wrong yeah, about no, that. That's insane. <laughs> But anyway. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Onward. Onward. <laughs> so these people were uh, uh, destroyed by meth hogs. And the uh, entire area was covered with giant cloven hog tracks. At least one set of these tracks seemed to be from an animal with three toes on each foot. Several other similar disappearances have been reported since. Um, it wasn't until 2010 that the first of um, these mutant hogs was killed. A trapper who was using a foot gripping trap, uh, which was a bit larger and more powerful than may, um, 
than that it may have been strictly legal. Right. Um, it caught one of the meth hogs, and he found the furious animal already being uh, beginning to gnaw its own leg off, trying to wow. escape. Wow. <laughs> the man, who wished to remain anonymous out of fear of pro- uh, prosecution for his overzealous trapping habits, um, said <laughs> it took him six shots directly into the creature's head um, at as close a range as he could manage to kill it. And this was a small specimen, only about 400 pounds. Wow. When he carved open the hog, uh, what he discovered was astounding. The animal's skin was almost impossible to penetrate, and the man had to use a chainsaw to make its way into the body. Um, The first thing that he noticed was the ungodly odor that emanated from the animal's body. The man said it smelled much worse than the usual dead hog, like eggs that had been left rotting in the sun. Wow. The usual thick layer of fat found under a hog's skin was, in this case, laced with a thick webbing of cartilage. Oh, fascinating. Very. The combination of cartilage and fat would be flexible when the animal was moving. It's but like compre- armor. Yeah, right? But compressed into an incredibly firm layer when struck directly, essentially functioning like a bulletproof <laughs> Kevlar, vest. Kevlar, right. Literally. Yeah. Whoa. Um, The meth hog's internal organs were also quite a sight. Uh, The beast had two livers, four kidneys, and a (laughs) large number of unusual lumpy tumors throughout its body. Hmm. More room to carry the meth. Um, (laughs) The creature also had an unusual case of meth mouth. Oh, Oh my gosh. With six eight-inch tusks protruding at odd angles from its mouth and and two additional rows of teeth in its jaws. To top it all off, the hog was outfitted with four testicles. (laughs) The hunter burnt the body, saying, ain't no way in hell I was going to eat that. (laughs) No, sir. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. That's insane. If all these mutant hogs are as well equipped as the one that was trapped and killed, it could explain their unusually aggressive behavior. Male hogs can get very aggressive when it's mating time, and with double the amount of hormones coursing through their bodies, they must have been unstoppable. Uh, The meth hogs seem like they are breeding and spreading through eastern Kentucky, causing damage, threatening lives and livestock, and just generally causing all kinds of trouble. So this is a this is a real this is a real 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 thing. Right, right. right. I mean, it's it's possible that it's not meth related right it's possible that we're just dealing with some kind of other mutation evolutionary flaw inbreeding situation like the the deer the rotting deer syndrome or whatever have you Mm -hmm. heard about that yeah the zombie deer zombie deers yeah Yeah. but yes um so yeah moving on we're gonna draw our next one as i spill my coffee all all over (laughs) i get the chaos level (laughs) Cauldron of Doom. All right. What have I got here? What I've got here is... um, Sounds dirty, but okay. Pope Lick Monster. Nice. The The Pope Pope Lick Lick Monster. Monster. Uh, The Swiss Guard will have something to say about that. (laughs) So here's the thing with the Pope Lick Monster. Um, If you've never been to Kentucky, there's all sorts of places with the last word of the name lick um yep, like yep. maze lick maze lick um, yep yeah blue lick uh pope lick all the th- why i don't know um but that's why it the is pope a thing. travels in that encased vehicle exactly mm-hmm. the pope mobile so the pope lick monster is a well-known urban legend from louisville kentucky hey, where we're going, we're going, we're going um specifically associated with the pope lick creek area This legend has been a part of local folklore for many years and centers around a creature said to inhabit the area around the Poplick train trestle. Now, the Poplick monster is often described as a human-goat hybrid with grotesque features. Hmm. It typically is depicted with the body of a man with the lower torso of a goat. Kind of like... A pan. Yes, Uh, exactly. A a, um, satyr. Yes. um, Complete with fur, hooves, and horns. Some variations of the legend also describe it as having alabaster skin. And it's very interesting because encounters with satyrs are not uncommon. Um, As a matter of fact, there's a a book that a man wrote, I think in the early part of the 20th century, about his encounter with a fawn. Uh, A fawn being a satyr and or 
creature, um, half goat, half man. Uh, and he was actually brought to Pan, uh-huh. the god Pan. Pan is one of the strangest <laughs> gods of the Greek pantheon because he predates Greece. Exactly. He is actually uh, borrowed into the system, and he has a lot of strange things. But one of the most intriguing ideas behind Pan is it's where we get the word pandemonium. Oh, oh. I didn't know that. Pan is able to create mass hysteria. And so when you have that that notion of mass hysteria, when you have that that concept that uh, it, it can create this behavior, this animalistic behavior, coming into contact with these creatures oftentimes is followed by wild craziness, wild insanity. Exactly. So this one um, is quite interesting. So uh, it has alabaster skin and wide, unblinking eyes, which is quite um, that would do it concerning. Uh, so, the origin of the legend, uh, the exact origins of the public monster legend are unclear, but it has been a part of local folklore for decades. The story likely grew from a combination of heresy and the, <laughs> that <laughs> happened. Yeah, and the eerie nature of the train trestle area and the human fascination with the supernatural. I'm sure. So the public monster legend likely evolved from a mix of local folklore and storytelling. Uh, rural and wooded areas often give rise to tales of mysterious creatures. And the public area with its imposing train trestle provided a perfect backdrop for such stories. Mm -hmm. Um, You see that in a lot of places like where uh, entities or ghost stories will just get plopped down in places where like, you know, that'd be a creepy place for this. And anytime you uh, you cross water. So yeah. anytime yes. you cross over water, bridges, especially uh, trolls under bridges, creatures under bridges, uh, ghosts on bridges, uh, goat man's bridge, goat man's bridge, all of that uh, comes from ancient fear of crossing water without the permission of the spirits that guard that water. Exactly. Mm. Um, so the public train trestle itself is a significant element in the origin of the legend. This large imposing structure, which is genuinely hazardous, could easily inspire ominous tales. Um, the danger associated with the trestle from real accidents and fatalities may have contributed to the mythologi- uh, mythology mythologizing of the area. That's a tough word. It, it is. is a really That's tough a- word. Mythologizing. Yes. Mythologizing. Mythologizing. Oh, <laughs> Too many syllables. Exactly. <laughs> and the description of the public, uh, public monster as a part man, part goat creature taps into a longstanding uh, mythological motif. Human animal hybrids are common in folklore worldwide, often symbolizing the crossing of boundaries or the manifestations of primal fears. So the legend um, might have been influenced by other myths and folklore, such as European tales of fawns and satyrs, uh, or even the American folklore surrounding creatures like Bigfoot. The aspect of the monster uses uh, using hypnosis or voice mimicry to lure people to their deaths mm. is a modern twist typical of urban legends. It adds to a psychological horror element to the tale, making it more compelling and eerie. Uh, one version of the legend suggests that the public monster was a former circus performer who was mistreated and now seeks revenge. Ooh. There you go. This narrative could be influenced by the historical reality of freak shows, which often featured people with unusual physical characteristics and were popular in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Like many legends, the story of the public monster probably evolved over time. Uh, Each telling would add new layers to the story, gradually transforming it into a legend known today. The local community and media likely played a role in both spreading and embellishing the legend, covering an alleged sightings or accidents at the trestle would contribute to the myth's presence or persistence. Um, Yes, so basically the public monster mimics people and lures them under the bridge like a troll. Hmm, How interesting. Yeah, which is quite fascinating. So it's, yes. but yeah, there is not a ton on it. And maybe when we go to Louisville, we'll be able to like ask Let's people about. Let's, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll so. swing by that trestle. That's absolutely cool. It's interesting too, because um, something that happens at bridges is some kind of phenomenon that causes water that runs under a bridge to sound like a baby crying. Mm-hmm. And so you have crybaby bridge in multiple places. Like the first time I heard it, I was like, oh, that's really creepy. Yes. And then somebody else told me the story, but they were in a totally different area. Right. Like, oh yeah, there's a crybaby bridge right over there. I was like, wait, 
I thought it was in South Carolina. It's like, no, it's right over no, there. No, it's right over here. And, mm-hmm. and so I've heard the Crybaby Bridge a couple of times. I was like, so there must be something about bridges and the acoustics and running water right. that, mm-hmm. that, that, that mimics it. Or there is some weird entity. Yeah, I was about to say. That mm-hmm. hangs out around bridges <clears throat> and puts out a, the distress call. Because a crying baby is a distress call that should draw a concerned human. Exactly. Like, you know, you, you, oh, want, yeah. you want to trap somebody? Make a sound of a distressed baby, baby, so and, they'll come right after, and, and people will come right after it. Oh yeah, exactly. So you know, it's it. That's an interesting thing. The idea of of a mimic sitting there going, well, you know, people haven't come for the baby in a while. Maybe if I just sounded like a person. Exactly. Yes. So the legend suggests that the creature uses hypnosis or voice mimicry to lure trespassers onto the train trellis, where they meet their demise either by falling from the trellis or being hit by an oncoming train. There you go. So. um the central to the legend of the public train trestle itself, which is a real structure, the trestle is a dangerous and off-limits area, but it has been the site of numerous accidents and death, often due to individuals trying to investigate the legends across the trestle. <laughs> so they were lured there <laughs> by the creature, yes. regardless of anything. That legend is true. Mm-hmm. They were lured by the monster and Yo. they died. Exactly. Wow. Um, local authorities and community leaders have repeatedly warned the public about the dangers of exploring the public train trestle. Despite no evidence of the creature's existence, the legend uh, continues to attract thrill seekers and curious um, people leading to real life hazards. Wow. Um, well, that's interesting, too, that that Goatman's Bridge has a very similar vibe to it. Exactly. You know, with a very similar creature, very similar vibe and it, 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 it makes you wonder about the wildfire of local legend right and the most significant and real encounters related to the public monster legend involve accidents of the trestle uh, the trestle is a dangerous place and there have been multiple fatalities and injuries over the years these are often um, when individuals are caught on the trestle by an oncoming train while looking for the monster um, while there are anecdotal reports of sightings of the Pope Lick monster, these are typically vague and unverified. They often describe a humanoid figure with goat-like features consistent with the legend, if Ooh, they make it out nice. alive. What you should do is like show up on one day and just tie a, um, a trail cam to the trestle. And Ooh, then that's come interesting. back that's interesting. three or four days later. That's smart. That's super interesting. So, yeah, we'll ask people while we're up there, you know, yeah. Yeah. like, hey, how you tell ever. Tell us about your goat, man. We won't tell the police. But, <laughs> we'll tell the police. <laughs> but Is yes. There one more? I think we are. Do you want to, oh, we're, we're out of yeah. time? We are, out, we of are time. out of time. But, yes, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. And honestly, we could probably do other states with this kind of concept. Yeah. It's fun. Um, I yeah. think it's great. Uh, we yeah. should go state by state because every yeah. state has their cryptid. specific cryptid yep. that um, that isn't anywhere else. Exactly. So um, if you would like to hear us do that, let us know. Um, and if you have a local cryptid or uh, entity you want to add to the hat for your state, let us Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a, ghost a lot of local, like the more localized mm-hmm. a an entity is, the less likely it is to be on the watch exactly. list of, of, of mm-hmm. these, you know, statewide things because people have, you know, the town monster, you know, right. the creature. Like you very rarely hear about the plat eye anywhere exactly. but Savannah but or Savannah, just yeah. south of Savannah. Right. Uh, so, you know, when you when you get around to it, um, the more localized a creature is, the more intriguing it is to mm-hmm. us because mm-hmm. it's it's something that we, we're not familiar with. Exactly. So, yes, uh, I think that is a great idea and we should definitely do it. But um, we are out of time, y'all, so we're going to wrap things up. Um, thank you guys again so much for listening to today's episode. Uh, don't forget to vote on Connect Savannah. That is open until the end of March, I believe. Mm-hmm. I think so. And uh, I, think so. I thought it was February 6th or March 6th. Oh. That could be correct. Go and check the fan base page. Ashley and Dawn have all of those they dates up there. Um, but yes, and you'll be able to find the link there. So definitely uh, go ahead and vote if you are feeling so compelled. Um, also, uh, if you want to become a para junkie, we are going to be rearing up here really quickly uh, for Waverly Hills. So there's going to be a lot of really fun content over on Patreon and all the fun content from the Conjuring House that um, not everybody gets to see. So I highly encourage you to join us over there. But with that, my name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And stay spooky, y'all.